Sometimes, investigating a story is a bit like eating an artichoke. We approach it by peeling off one leaf at a time. We'd rather people didn't know what we're doing until we're ready. We don't want to signpost it to rival journalists who could scoop us. And we don't want Bethel to instruct Jehovah's Witnesses not to speak. We're not just being paranoid. One day, as we're getting closer to the finish line, a serving Jehovah's Witness gets in touch. He sends us a list of announcements and reminders that's just been issued to elders by Watchtower in Britain. It tells them what to do if they're approached by members of the media. It says that if a journalist contacts an elder, the elder shouldn't commit to providing a response. And if they get in touch about a current or past judicial case, or the congregation's handling of a theocratic matter, two elders should immediately contact the service department. And then it says that all of these points will be added to the elders' manual, Shepherd the Flock of God. Even when someone does agree to speak to us, we have to think very carefully about whether we can trust them. A source Claire's talking to makes her very wary. What he said yesterday is that he had been informed by Bethel about particularly my activities and given my name as someone who was going around trying to speak what? to I know <laughs> trying to speak to Jehovah's Witnesses. The source is a former Jehovah's Witness who knows a lot about life inside the British Bethel and is still in contact with some of its leaders. And I said like, yeah, you, you know yeah. that's what I'm doing. But then he said, they know everything you're doing. They've got informants everywhere. It sounds like some of the people we've approached have been reporting what we're doing back to Bethel. Something about this particular source makes us wonder if he might be doing the same. But it's not going to stop us. We need to find out if the elders in Britain followed the rules set out in that 1997 letter, the ones which told them to make records of abuse allegations and send them off to Bethel. We know they followed these rules in Australia and America, where the database was proven. Without a data leak, the way to do that here is to find the records that the elders were told to produce. Documents where the details of alleged abusers have been filled in. These could be the fragments held in each congregation, or they could be documents held in Bethel itself. That's how we'll know for sure that the tip-off email that started us off on this year-long journey the one from Jill Owens that told us there's a library of abuse, is true. I'm Catherine Rushton, and this is Cool Bethel, from the Telegraph's investigations team. Episode 5, The Unknown Boy. It's June 2022, and we finally break cover. We publish our first article about this investigation in The Telegraph magazine, telling the stories of Daria, Michelle and Lacey. It means we can post messages on social media. I'm going straight to the XJW subreddit. I can't tell you how happy Janet is about this. She's been spending her evenings on the Reddit page for former Jehovah's Witnesses and has been waiting for this moment. I was on it last night, actually. Checking in. Checking in. Checking, <laughs> in. Checking in, seeing how everyone's doing. Dozens of new sources get in touch and we use the momentum to approach even more. Some are current Jehovah's Witnesses and ones are serving elder. They don't really think about what it does to the victims when people refuse to give evidence. The other confidential letter was about changes to policy over child abuse. I was horrified. It's not right. It's like we're 10 years pre-Savile. I contacted Bethel and he closed it by saying, it's the victim's right to report it if they want to, but we would never encourage it. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that these days, they always report child sexual abuse cases to the police if they believe a child is still at risk, or if they're required to by law. Or there's, quote, some other valid reason. But one of the former elders who comes forward has a story of what happened when he did go to the police about a case of child abuse in his congregation. He's asked to remain anonymous, 
so we're using the pseudonym Patrick. We've got an actor to voice his words. Uh, Hello. Fine, thanks. Unlike other former elders we've spoken to, Patrick's still a Jehovah's Witness. He goes to his local Kingdom Hall twice a week. It's in Ireland, which is overseen by the British Bethel. I do believe there's something better. So the fundamental beliefs of witnesses, I still believe. Patrick still has faith in God, but not in how the Jehovah's Witness organisation works. Their leadership and how they dictate the work, I don't think it's correct. You know, it's far from the teachings of the Bible and Jesus. Patrick's concerns began in 2016. A case came up and some young girl in the hall came forward. The child said a man in the congregation was... Doing certain things, flashing, touching her. Patrick heard about it at an elders' meeting. His colleagues, who were investigating the case, said they'd confronted the accused man, but that... He denied it. They also called Bethel. And they said, we contacted the branch, we followed all the procedures. At the meeting, the elders discussed what to do. Oh, they said there was only one witness to this, so, you know, they, they don't need to report it. Let's just wait and see. So the coordinator of the body of the elders at the time said, does everybody agree with it, that we're not going to report it? I said, no. Shortly afterwards, a second child came forward and accused the same man of abusing her. This time, Patrick didn't let it go. I said, fine, you've got 24 hours to report it or I am. And they were like... No, you can't do this. We're not going to do it. And so I just said, look, my position as a father, as an elder, I believe that this needs to be reported. Before the 24 hours was up, Patrick says he called the circuit overseer, the regional manager responsible for his congregation. And he said, you know, if you do report it, you'll be deleted. Deleted. That's the Jehovah's Witness word for being demoted stripped of his elder position. I said, yeah, that's not what's important. It's the children being abused here. I rang the police and I told them what happened. From there on, everything just hit the fan. Well, sorry to be crude. Everybody just just panicked. Oh, we were going to report it. We were just about to do it. You ran ahead of us all. The man eventually confessed to serious wrongdoing and was stripped of his privileges. Things like handling the microphone in the Kingdom Hall. Shortly afterwards, Patrick was deleted, just like he'd feared, along with another elder who had spoken to the police. They just literally said, you're not loyal, so you don't qualify. So you ask the question, how was I not loyal? And they won't answer. The circuit overseer made the decision the one who Patrick says warned him. I've got no paperwork to prove it, but I believe it's a direct consequence of me going to the police. We aren't allowed to appeal it. After all this happened, a third child came forward accusing the same man of abuse. This time, the alleged paedophile was disfellowshipped. Meanwhile, Patrick's been fighting to have his status as an elder restored. So far, it hasn't been. Patrick's not the only person we speak to who's still battling to return to their old position in the Jehovah's Witnesses. In an investigation, there are always loose threads. You might pour your time and effort into one or two main lines of inquiry, but you also keep picking away at others, just in case. One of those loose threads is Nick French's case. He's the former elder who was abused by his Jehovah's Witness stepfather, Gary Mosscrop. It wasn't until I was about 13 and I was raped by him that I just said to myself, this must never happen again. Gary Mosscrop was disfellowshipped. He was later convicted for sexually abusing Nick as a child. He left prison a few years ago and we've been trying to find out what's happened to him. We use the same techniques as always, studying his family tree and using land registry to check addresses. But we get stuck. Until one day, Nick emails me to say he's found out that Gary Mosscrop has changed his name. It's enough to lead my colleague Claire to his door. 
Hi, it's nice to you. I'm looking for Gary Muscrop. That's me. Oh, I wonder if you can help me. I'm a journalist from The Telegraph. Uh, would it be possible to talk to you? I want to say that I've checked with Nick before including this conversation. We don't want to give convicted paedophiles a platform. But what you're about to hear is important, because Gary Moscrop's the only person we've spoken to who's probably in the abuse database. And is it right that you were disfellowshipped? Yes, I was, yeah. I still am. They get on to Gary Moscrop's trial, and he sounds upset that Nick went to the police about him. Yes, I don't know why he did that, because he knew that I'd spent ten years outside with nobody talking to me. And the next minute, he goes and puts me in court. The Jehovah's Witnesses have told us that judicial committees are there to deal with the spiritual side of things and that the police deal with criminality. But Gary Moscrop seems to think it was an injustice for Nick to press charges against him when he'd already been disfellowshipped and shunned. Can I ask you something, actually? Yeah. Uh, Talk turns to the records that elders are told to make when congregants are accused of abuse. I've read various kind of documents that show that the Jehovah's Witness organisation document these kind of allegations very thoroughly, whether it's on disfellowshipping forms or just files on individual congregants. Did you know that? I'm not aware of that, no. Oh, OK. I wasn't sure whether That's it was... no problem. You wouldn't have a problem with it? It's no problem, Because no. people say there's this database of allegations of child sex abuse allegations. Have you heard about that? No. From what we've learned about the inner workings of the Jehovah's Witnesses, there should be a file on Gary Moscrop, one of the records that elders are told to make, so that there's something they can look up if he asks to rejoin. That's something he wants to do. I'm working very hard now to get back. To get back into the um, yes. congregation? Yes, I am. Like anyone who's disfellowshipped, he's still allowed to sit at the back of meetings at his local kingdom hall. You have to attend the meetings mm. and you sit in the back of the hall mm. and nobody speaks to you. Not that they don't want to, because they do. Members of the congregation are supposed to shun him, but Gary Moscrop says they show him warmth. There's many, many times when you're sitting in the back, like I am a few times, and you suddenly look and someone sees you and he, he goes... Mm. They wait. It's very hard not to. Back in the office, Claire updates me. Talking to Gary Moscrop and sitting in his home, I actually found it quite disturbing knowing what he'd done to Nick French. It made me quite uneasy. He wants to get back into a local congregation close to his home and has been making quite a big effort to do that. Of course, that's a different thing to whether the Jehovah's Witnesses actually let him back in. They might not. It is a different thing. But I wonder how much of a stretch it is, because look at this. So basically, a source has sent me um, this document, which says guidelines for branch service desk use only at the top. Um, it is quite old. It's 2005, and it doesn't say what country it applies to. But it seems to be basically a kind of guide for people on the service desk of how to handle calls from elders asking what to do about um, known former child molesters in their congregations. Yeah, so okay, there's a question at the top, you're right, that says basically, can a former child molester qualify for a responsible position in the congregation, even if the molestation took place before they became a baptised Christian? Yeah, and can you see, like, the, the answer is not necessarily. Yeah. And it's got all those different factors that you have to consider. Yeah, so there's questions, isn't there? A bit like, how many years ago did he commit the sin? Were the authorities ever informed of his actions? That makes me think of the situation in Australia and all those alleged paedophiles where there was no evidence that the Jehovah's Witnesses had reported them to the police. Yeah. It begs the question, where are the police in all of this? I wonder if they've ever seen the document that I'm looking at right now. Since Claire got back from William and Eleanor's house on the coast, she's been digging through old cases and interviews she's already done, looking for mentions of police investigations. One day she has an update. I just realised that some of the police officers had the same names. And I thought, that's quite interesting. 
And so I did some digging and mm. I ended up putting an allegation or a point anywhere. I tried to do it in a friendly way initially, but didn't work to the Metropolitan Police. And did you know that the Metropolitan Police launched an operation specifically in the, to do the Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah. I didn't know no, that. I did not know that. The operation that Claire's heard about has a very strange name. Do you what know, does that mean, that word? I don't know. Can you just Google it? Yeah. A school or other educational institution. Oh. Frontistry. Frontistry. Operation Frontistry. The Jehovah's Witness organisation says they haven't heard of it. But when we listen back to interviews we've done, it sounds like a string of former members who've reported cases to the police might have ended up giving evidence to Operation Frontistry as well. I think maybe like yourself, they were like building a case because he said they've been speaking to a number of elders. I spoke to a Metropolitan Police guy who came round taking evidence. I think he was sort of hinting along the lines that they were trying to get reason to maybe subpoena Bethel. Claire's been going back and forth with the Met to try and get details about Operation Frontistry. They've come back and said it's specifically looking at child sex abuse. A major police investigation looking at precisely the same issues that we are. It feels like validation of sorts. That the police also thought that there were legitimate reasons to investigate. But there's a hitch. And so I've seen loads of emails with them dropping away. The police closed the investigation in December 2020. I'd have been so excited if it was still ongoing. We never find out why Operation Frontistry ended. Perhaps it was a resource issue. Or maybe it was just too hard. Later, Sophie tells me about an email she's seen from a woman, a former Jehovah's Witness, who wrote to the police last year. She doesn't want to be named, but she says we can use her real voice. The woman raised a lot of the same points that were in that original tip email to us from Jill Owens about there being a database of abuse. Can you tell us why you sent that email to the police? Um, I'd kind of been watching what had been going on around the world. So when ICSA said that they were going to be including Jehovah's Witnesses, I was quite excited, relieved. I don't really know what the word is, but I I was hoping that they'd give it the same treatment that the Australian Royal Commission would and get their own hands on the database and do a thorough job. X is the British Child Abuse Inquiry. It hasn't concluded yet, but she found one of its reports on religious groups disappointing. So it was out of frustration that I ended up going to the Met, really, because the data's there... It's their role to deal with the criminality of things. So I I had no idea whether they even knew about it or or not, but I couldn't stay silent on the matter. And you sent it last year. It's quite long, but do you mind just reading the last line for me, please? I said, please act quickly. With every day that goes by, children are at risk of being sexually abused by people who are known abusers on a list held by a religion. Religious freedom should not come above child protection. Let them deal with the sin, but the police needs to deal with the crime. I've seen a copy of the response that the police sent to the woman Sophie's been speaking to. It says, I'm afraid there is no evidence or detail of any crime in your email, and I would caution against comments alleging entire religions to be considered criminal, as such comments could constitute offences in certain circumstances. It would be very easy for us to become daunted by this investigation. But we're determined to keep going. We need to hoover up every last lead. It's the best chance we have of getting to the filled-in documents, the ones that show that the elders read that 1997 letter and did exactly as they were told. More on that after the break. Hi, Claire Newell here. I'm the investigations editor at The Telegraph and one of the reporters on Call Bethel. My team spends months working on stories like the one you're hearing in this series. We dig into court files and knock on doors to make sure we get all the details right. The four of us spent days following up on leads and listening to sources. Investigative journalism takes time and we couldn't do our work without The Telegraph's subscribers. If you'd like to support our original journalism and read our award-winning stories, 
head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash Bethel podcast, where you can get 30 days free access to the Telegraph online. That's telegraph.co.uk forward slash Bethel podcast, or click on the link in the episode description. One of the first big cases we started looking into at the beginning of this investigation was Daria's, A versus Watchtower. We've kept on digging into Peter Stewart. He's the one that confessed to abusing Michelle, but was left free to abuse Daria as well. Then he went to prison for abusing another child. We want to find out where he came from before he turned up at Daria and Michelle's congregation. Was he always a Jehovah's Witness? Or did he convert to the religion later in life? We know he's dead, so Claire orders his death certificate. It says he was born in Hammersmith, but strangely, when I have a look for his birth record, I can't find it. There's no one with that exact name born on that day in this country. It's odd, isn't it? I wonder if he did a Gary Moss crop and changed his name. Yeah, potentially. And I wonder if he did that, was he hiding from something? Yeah, why change a name? Another thread connected to Peter Stewart bears more fruit. I managed to get hold of documents that were disclosed as part of the case Daria brought in the High Court. They arrive through the post, and one piece of paper stands out. Not because it's new, but because it's so similar to a document I've seen before. One that's on our wall in our office, under orange for Britain. I think... Maybe, Claire, you'll recognise what that is. Is it the columns? The, it's the, the first the amazing, English example. The column document. I'm very excited. It says child protection at the top in bold letters. Then there's a table with six columns, each with a title above it. It's like the document that that former elder, Virgil Turner, shared with me. The blank table to be filled in with the names of alleged abusers and the children they're said to have harmed. But there's one crucial difference. This one's been completed. We've spent months hunting for this, and here, in my hand, is proof that the Jehovah's Witnesses in Britain have kept records about child abuse. That's not all it tells us either. So you've got the name Peter Stewart there, Mm. and then you've got the redacted names of children under identity of victims... But the absolutely horrifying thing is how many of them there are. Yeah, it looks like there are five, doesn't it? Um, So we already know about Daria Michelle and that Peter Stewart was jailed for abusing a little girl. But that leaves two others, which is it's just horrible. Just who are these children? And have you seen there? There's another interesting column. So you've got the names of... I guess I think they're five men because I recognise that one, Mm. A. Orton. Yeah, so Alan Orton, the man who ripped up Daria's letter. Mm. At the top of the column, there's these other words, elders handling the matter. Elders handling the matter? What does it mean? And in fact, what's the significance of this document in the case of Peter Stewart? We don't know if the other children on this list came to the elders' attention before or after Michelle and Daria. Alan Orton's dead, so we can't expect him to tell us. But there are the names of other men on this list. We want to ask them why they're there and how these cases were handled. It's time to speak to all the men who were elders in Daria and Michelle's congregation at the time. We know some of their names from Daria's court case. We want to find out what they think happened and why mistakes were made. Sometimes, there's no substitute for knocking on doors. What else did he say in the witness statement? Anything significant? I'm going to need to pull both of them up. There are 18 people to get round in total. So we've got three primary people we need to approach, and then some others after that. And basically, I think what we're saying is... We're going to name you in our podcast or in an article. What's your response? You know, what's your side of the story? Janet, if you've got those letters in front of you, we can think through what the different allegations are and what we're going to say to each person. 
Claire, Janet and Jack have written letters for the people they're going to knock. We can do that tomorrow and get them all blitzed in one day and then there's less chance they'll be able to talk to each other and be put off from answering the door. They meet early the next morning to travel to the Midlands. Uh, we're just about to go and do our door knocks. The basic question is why was not more done right at the beginning when the confession was made and it would have stopped a lot of what happened afterwards. Really, we've got to make sure we've said a sentence before they can close the door. Because yeah. they've got to know what it's about. Because otherwise we might be in a situation where they close the door before we've spoken and they never open the letter. The knocks don't go well. Can I ask whether you handed over the documentation that you have about... OK. I'm just going to put it in an envelope and post it to the store. Hello, sorry to bother you. I'm looking for someone called... Uh, I don't suppose he lives next door. I just got a message from Janet that is dead. By the end of the day, it feels like words got around the elders of Daria and Michelle's old congregation. Well, I was kind of coming and going, but the neighbours said he was he was out initially, but then I saw his car was back, um, so it very much looked like he was there. But because we'd talked to one of the other elders who lived just up the road, we kind of suspected that he'd been told not to open the door to us. Then something goes right. Hello, oh, hello. sorry to bother you. I'm looking for someone called Thomas Hall. Yes. Do you mind if I speak no, to him? No, you just come in. Thank you. Claire's had so many doors closed on her today. She's surprised when Thomas Hall's wife invites her in. She's asked us not to use her name, so we're going to call her Marjorie. She frequently answers for her husband. Marjorie and Thomas are still Jehovah's Witnesses. They were in the same congregation as Peter Stewart and remember finding out when he'd been arrested. We were going from door to door and I noticed Peter's dairy order's still out and from the other day, you know, it wouldn't have been out. I says, what, what are we to do? Yeah. The police were there and the fire brigade and the broken. Oh, and, thinking and something had happened to him? Yeah, there was no, nobody there. Well, we didn't know what had happened, you yeah. say. And then the police found out that he was in prison. When Peter Stewart confessed to child abuse, do you think... He, the never, old... he never confessed as, long, as, as far as I knew. He definitely did, he, not as far as you know, but he confessed to some elders in 1990. The three elders that sat on the judicial committee where Peter Stewart confessed are all dead now. But this couple are their contemporaries. Could they shed light on their thinking? We haven't heard of paedophiles, mm. have we? Phew, that was, that's a new word to us. Well, I don't know, you know, it's not, I guess 1990, I can't remember, I wasn't very old then. Um, but... You know, I guess everyone knew, even if you didn't know the word, everyone knew it was wrong to sexually abuse a child, oh, you know. definitely. But we realised we didn't know anything about him. He just yeah. landed in our congregation and he was such a gentleman. Was he? Oh, ever such a gentleman, wasn't he, Bill? Oh, um, Bill? Yeah. That catches Claire's attention like a record scratch. Short for William. Claire knows the name William Hall. It's one of the names on the child protection list in the column headed Elders Handling the Matter. Can I just check, are you William Hall? Yes. I've been looking, so there's two people I was looking for, a William Hall and a uh, Thomas Hall. Well, That's he's nice. Thomas William. Oh, I see. <laughs> there, that, now I know you're William. There's also another thing I need to ask you. So there's these records that were going kept in all congregations that had the victim's name, it had the accused name, whether the police were told, and it's got your name. William Hall next to the name of a victim who was abused by Peter Stewart. Do you remember that? I'm trying to think his name. I'm sure he was a, a boy, a little boy. Oh. A boy. Not Daria or Michelle, or the little girl he went to jail over. Because we didn't like it because they used to stay with Peter, didn't they? Oh, the right, mom, the family did. No, the mum used right. to let them come over and stay with Peter and we thought an old man shouldn't be looking after... Yeah, that is a bit strange. Yeah, we thought it was a bit strange. So did um, one of these children, do you remember whether they told you they were being abused by Peter Stewart? 
no, 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 never told me. Why do you think your name appears on this document then, next to the name of one of the children and Peter Stewart? I can't honestly tell you. I don't want to say anything that's not true. The conversation goes round and round in circles. But eventually, the couple remember the name of the young boy they were worried about. It's not a name we've heard before. Well, he's a man now. Yeah, of course. He's still a Jehovah's Witness. William, I'm going to stop calling him Thomas now, says his memory is not as good as it used to be. And he didn't participate in Daria's court case because he's been unwell. But he still says he was aware of some allegations. Allegations that concerned this boy and Peter Stewart. No, it's this boy. The boy. The boy told you. I've got a feeling it would become general knowledge, as I don't know why. General knowledge that a little boy was either being abused or at risk of being so. So you became aware of it somehow? Yes, somebody would have said something and and there'd be a little group of elders dealing with it. Yes. And Bill might have been one of them. So from what Marjorie said, it sounds like the elders had a meeting about this boy's case. But I don't know if it was a judicial committee. It sounds like it could have been, doesn't it? Yeah, maybe. And the other thing I wonder is, when did it happen? Was Mm. it before or after Michelle and Daria's cases? And did somebody report it to the police? It's not very surprising that so many of the elders didn't want to get into details when my colleagues turned up at their doors. A lot of them told us to talk to Bethel, or said they were going to. But that conversation with William and Marjorie was illuminating. They said Peter Stewart just landed in the congregation. We've been trying to find out where from. Afterwards, we discovered that he'd been married and had six children, and that he was the only Jehovah's Witness in his family. We've also found out that he did change his name before he was married. The reason we couldn't find Peter Stewart's birth certificate is that it appears he was born Cecil Peter Broad. William and Marjorie mentioned a boy they'd been worried about who used to stay at Peter Stewart's home. This little boy, a boy whose name we'd never heard before, feels somehow emblematic of the children that could be harmed if allegations of child abuse aren't reported to the police. Every time. Because paedophiles that abuse once often abuse again. Shortly after this podcast launches, a woman gets in touch. She knows the name of one of the other paedophiles we've talked about, Clifford Whiteley. He's the man who abused Lacey Jones. I give this woman a call. I have spoke about it, but not... Not a lot, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's chosen to remain anonymous, but she tells us that when she was 21, he sexually assaulted her as well. She'd already told the police during Lacey's case that Clifford Whiteley had groped her through her clothes. But she hadn't told them everything, or pressed charges, because she didn't want to upset her Jehovah's Witness parents. When she speaks to me, she says that actually... What Clifford Whiteley did to her went much further. I've kept in touch with the policeman who worked on Lacey's case, Detective Philip Ensor, and I've been asking him to send me some key documents from Clifford Whiteley's trial. One morning, as I'm about to leave for work, he comes through. Within this envelope were two pieces of paper and he admitted to one occasion of sexual assault upon her. On the first sheet is a document reference number and the shadow of thick black lines where someone's redacted information on the back. The front cover bears Clifford Whiteley's name. It's the form that elders are told to complete when someone's disfellowshipped. An S-77. The one they used to put in a blue envelope and that we've spent ages looking for. Detective Ensor had to take the Jehovah's Witnesses to court to make them hand this one over. It's from 2019, when Clifford Whiteley was kicked out. And it's filled in with his details. It says there was a hearing to consider a confession of poor Nia 
brackets, digital penetration, in capital letters, child abuse, against Lacey Jones, which occurred 10 years ago when she was 11. And then a bit further down, it's talking about Clifford Whiteley making a personal statement. He admitted to, in capitals, one instance of digital penetration. And have you seen over the page? So then there's, like, that looks more like a form. Yeah, it does look like a form and that's it... been completed. Yes, and the, on the bottom kind of left-hand corner, it says S77. And so the other thing that I found really striking about this, actually, is you've got the bit that you read out where um, he's admitting to one instance of abuse, basically, of Lacey Jones. But then it's just got lines and lines about him being sorry. He was drunk. He felt deeply ashamed. He was distraught. And that does fit with the idea that the judicial committees are there to assess whether someone has repented or not, yes. doesn't it? Rather yeah. than the actual um, sin looking or at, crime at its heart. Looking at yeah. their spiritual state, I guess, if he's sorry and distraught. When she saw this document, Lacey was sickened. I need a stronger word than angry. I need... I don't think there's a word powerful enough to describe how it makes me feel to read something like this. It's the final piece of evidence we need to show that elders in Britain have been recording abuse allegations and that they followed the rules in that 1997 letter and that they did so as recently as 2019. I print off a copy and stick it on the wall under orange for Britain. We don't know for sure if this S77 was held at Bethel, as well as at Lacey's congregation. But at the bottom, there's a box with instructions for elders. It says that the completed form needs to go to the service department. It feels likely that if the elders followed some of the rules to make detailed records of abuse cases, they will have followed the rest of them too and sent it off to the headquarters. And if that's the case, then that means that the pages that Detective Ensor's just sent me could be a fragment of the database itself. We've learned a lot over the last year. We've spoken to abuse victims who tried to report what's happened to them, but were let down. We've got a copy of the British 1997 letter with its strict rules for elders telling them to record allegations of abuse. And we've got an S77 and the child protection list filled in with details of British paedophiles. All of this is how I ended up at Bethel in Chelmsford earlier this year with a letter in my hand. I'm just around the corner from the Jehovah's Witness headquarters. It's called Bethel. And quite honestly, it's really intimidating to... I wanted to put what we found out to the Jehovah's Witnesses... Blue sign saying JW.org. ..that there's a database inside Bethel, a library of information that includes admissions by paedophiles. A few days later, they respond. So the Jehovah's Witnesses say there really is nothing secret here. They say that their record-keeping about child sexual abuse is out in the public domain. They highlight that at ICSA, one of their senior people actually mentioned their record keeping about child sexual abuse. What they say is that these records help to keep children safe and that they also ensure that people within the religious organisation aren't promoted. They told us that the service desk actually work with elders to make sure that if a child is in danger, the police are notified. Mm. And in the email they sent us, there was a letter attached, which also highlights that there are quite a lot of cases where elders have informed the police after an allegation about child sexual abuse was made. What I can't help wondering is, how do you evaluate whether a child is still in danger from a paedophile? Because, you know, they can be manipulative, like Peter Stewart. They sometimes offend into old age. And they don't restrict their lives to their kind of Jehovah's Witness dealings. They'll also, you know, they live in our towns, they go to the park, they hold down jobs. So whilst they're still alive, how can you know that they're not going to be a risk to other children? It seems like an enormous call for the Jehovah's Witnesses to make. 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. How can they ever be 100% sure? Elders will also report cases to the police if they're legally obliged to do so. So says the letter. That's one of the things that could have made a difference in Daria and Michelle's cases if it had been mandatory for their elders to report Peter Stewart to the police. There are laws like that in other parts of the world, but there's no such obligation in Britain. At the moment, it, you don't have to, if you get told about child abuse and you're you know, senior in a religion or if you're even a teacher, you don't have to uh. report that necessarily to the police. Some people think there's a problem with mandatory reporting, that it generates too many reports and makes finding the children who are in real danger, like looking for a needle in a haystack. But survivors like Daria aren't convinced. It's kind of insulting as well. Like, why do they have it elsewhere, but not here? It's just, is it too expensive? Is it too much bother? Is it another safeguarding referral that people just don't want to have to make? Daria's got a unique perspective, because she works in social services. So she sees it from a professional point of view, as well as as someone who's been abused. And mandatory reporting's not the only change she feels strongly about. She also thinks that people whose jobs involve protecting children, police and social workers and so on, should be trained to understand the Jehovah's Witness world. They don't have the ability to communicate in the way that other children do because they would potentially be using terminology that would be unfamiliar. Certainly from my perspective, even when I started to disclose, I was saying an awful lot and constantly coming up against walls of people understanding. Michelle, on the other hand, is pessimistic that things will ever really change. Because they are arrogant and they don't believe they need to. And I think because of how paedophiles behave, they will always hunt out things like this. It will still be happening now. There'll be children that are going through exactly the same as what I went through. As the survivors we've spoken to tell us, the impact on those children will be lasting. They may have learnt to live with what's happened to them, but it still haunts them daily, often in unexpected ways. The years of gaslighting have damaged Michelle's confidence. Even now, you know, I don't trust myself, my judgement, you know, my decision-making. She also has a phobia of buttons, that goes back to when she would get her hair caught on Peter Stewart's clothes. Daria says she fears being drugged because of a time Peter Stewart plied her with cider and raped her. If I eat something, I don't know where it's come from, I'll then potentially have a panic attack thinking someone's tried to drug me. But the abuse was not the end of it. For the victims we've spoken to, it was made worse by the Jehovah's Witnesses' response. But a lot of the impact came from how they dealt with it. Um, it's not anything that ever goes away. I'm trying to deal with the, the, the demons of it. Have, you know, horrible anxiety and panic attacks. Their actions have impacted our lives immensely. A lot of heartache that, and a lot of abuse that I went through and has affected my life. How much heartache could have been saved if things had been dealt with differently? if the allegations and confessions that members of the Jehovah's Witnesses wrote down were routinely reported to the police. We've asked Bethel whether they handed their database to the authorities. They wouldn't tell us. But from where I'm sitting, it feels very wrong that anyone could collect that sort of information and not feel compelled to hand them every last line. The documents we've seen have told us a lot about what the database contains. But they have also left us with questions, like how many children are named in the abuse database? Could one of them be that little boy? The one that William and Marjorie Hall were worried about all that time ago? And more importantly, how many alleged paedophiles are named there that still need to be held to account? We've proved the database exists. Now for Lacey, the fight to get hold of it is just getting started. If you've got a database of paedophiles, wouldn't you want to know and find that? Do you not want to protect the children? But no investigation is ever truly finished. Have you seen this email? It's quite interesting.
I'm Catherine Rushton, and this was Cool Bethel. Thank you for listening. And if you liked the series, please do leave a five-star rating and a short review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help new listeners find us and help share the stories of the people affected. Please do consider taking out a Telegraph subscription. We couldn't have made this show without our subscribers. You can sign up for 30 days free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash Bethel podcast. Don't forget you can find exclusive details and pictures from the series at telegraph.co.uk forward slash call Bethel. And if you have information to share, please email us at callbethel at telegraph.co.uk. Call Bethel was written by me, Catherine Rushton. The investigations team behind it are Claire Newell, Sophie Barnes, Janet Eastham and Jack Leather. This episode was produced by Holly Fisher and the series producer is Pete Norton. The executive producers are Cara McGugan and Theodora Leloudis. I'd also like to thank Rachel Welsh, Louisa Wells and Giles Gear for all their help with the series. <laughs>